This is our distinguished lecture series on early childhood care and education policy. Um, why do we do our distinguished lecture series? Why are we focused on this issue? Well, uh, we're unique at Colorado Christian University. We have it as a mandate, if you look at our strategic priorities, to try to influence culture to try to make a difference. That's why we work at the Capitol to try to influence bills and we've had a chance to work with uh, Senator-elect Brittany Pedersen before. Um, we're invested in trying to shape our communities here at Colorado Christian University. And one of those is towards uh, healthy family values, which is the issue we're gonna cover tonight. You know, every day millions of working parents struggle with keeping careers on track while raising children and finding balance between child rearing and building a career is exceptionally hard. The first thousand days of a child's life in particular set the foundation upon which all future development and learning take place. Employers and our wider society benefit when children get the right start and thrive. And society and employers win when working parents are productive. Although most, both beneficiaries can do far more to ensure working parents are equipped to nurture their children and advance their careers, state and federal policies have not been responsive or supportive of this fundamental social issue. If work is truly the path towards economic security and upward mobility, public and workplace policies that allow parents to succeed in the workforce and do right by their children are vital to the future success of our country. Some of the questions we're gonna to explore tonight. Should America expand paid maternity leave? How do you balance the needs of parents, children, and small business owners? Should the state of Colorado provide free preschool and kindergarten? Are there free market-based policies that can serve parents, children, and business owners? And what are the other options to support early childhood education? What's working for parents and children and what's broken now? The truth is, friends, uh, this is an issue that's gonna be coming at you, especially students, if you choose to have a family. It's an issue that my wife and I work, with, uh, work through all the time. Uh, we both feel called to care for our children and we want to raise them the very best that we possibly can. At the same time, uh, we both feel called to have careers and to try to work uh, in the community. My wife's an attorney and I work here at CCU. So how do you balance all that? Moreover, uh, if you're a single parent or uh, maybe both parents are working, but it's just it's really hard to make ends meet, how do you balance all that uh, with caring for your children? It's a very uh, challenging question. And tonight we're gonna to explore that. Before I introduce our speakers, I wanna thank Sue Renner. Sue, raise your hand. Sue's right here with the Mirage Foundation. We partnered with Sue on this, and I wanna thank you very much for that. Can we give her a round of applause? Thank you. All right, tonight we're gonna to hear from some great experts, so I'm proud to introduce them to you now. Uh, we're gonna hear from Katherine Stevens, who is a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C is in education policy studies where she leads their early childhood program. Her areas of focus include early childhood education, early childhood development, pre-K, preschool, child care, home visiting, and teacher caregiver quality. Her work includes the research policy and politics of early care and education. She also studies the role of early learning in increasing opportunities for low-income Americans and the challenges of implementing rapidly expanding early childhood initiatives, especially ensuring caregiver and teacher quality. Nadine Mienza, who I've known for years working with Rick Santorum, is the founding executive director of Patriot Voices, where she has shaped the organization's special emphasis on public policies that help working families. She has helped build unique Coalitions on issues such as paid family leave, health care, and tax reform. Nadine served as the, as, as the chairman of Hardwired Global, an organization working to stop religious oppression around the world. And she has advised the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the College Board, the NEEKC Foundation on policy development and strategic partnerships through her work with the Clapham Group. She was appointed by President Donald Trump to the Commission for International Religious Freedom in May of 2018. She served as a senior advisor to Rick Santorum for president and on, U, on, on his U.S. Senate campaigns. She served as the finance director for the Pennsylvania Republican Party and as a consultant to the Republican National Committee. She worked on Capitol Hill for former Pennsylvania Senator John Hines. Uh, then we'll hear from Senator-elect Brittany Pedersen. Senator Pedersen has represented Colorado Christian University and the Lakewood area as a state representative for House District 28 for the past six years. She was recently elected state senator of Senate District 22. 
She was the first in her family to graduate from high school and college, and eventually uh, going on to serve as the youngest woman in the state house when she was first elected in 2012. While in the House, she served as the chair of the Education Committee, and she is passionate about fighting Colorado's opioid epidemic. President Sweeting and I have gotten a chance to work with Senator-elect Pedersen in previous legislative sessions, and we look forward to working with you again this year. And then our moderator tonight is Gloria Higgins. Ms. Higgins' entrepreneurial spirit has spanned 30 years in the financial service sector. She was a founding partner of a Denver CPA firm, co-founded of a financial technology firm, and president of a multifamily wealth management firm. The focus of each organization was financial services for multi-generational families supported through technology data aggregation. Throughout her business career, Ms. Higgins has served on numerous business boards and advisory committees. She has also been active in the philanthropic community, working with foundations and their organizational infrastructures, as well as serving on multiple nonprofit boards. The cornerstone of her commitment to early childhood education is the Denver Preschool Program, which she served as the founding board chair and a three-term board member. Ms. Higgins is the president of Executives Partnering to Invest in Children, or EPIC, and will serve tonight as tonight's panel moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Higgins and our speakers tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for the uh, warm-up act. You have more entertaining uh, comments than I can come up with in a week. So, guys, the fun is over, I guess. I don't know. Information's ahead now. Um, I wanted to spend about two minutes talking about executives partnering to invest in children because one would ask why should the business community and why should employers care about early childhood? And the fact of the matter is early childhood or child care specific is a cornerstone and a, a, a support for all working families. It's considered, from my perspective, an essential service that all businesses should really be paying attention to. And I think they're beginning to. That's the beauty of uh, our evolution around uh, the brain science and then some of the economic levers that are out there that are better served if we have a strong child care and early childhood uh, sector. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce the uh, panelists, and they can be the real uh, experts uh, in their subject matter, with uh, Catherine Stevens giving us a, a, a good history of the importance of early childhood and the recent brain science that kind of tells us that this is an, a very, very important uh, time frame in all, for all families and all children. Catherine? Uh, thank you so much for um, inviting me to speak with you tonight. I'm really excited about, about being here with this really fantastic panel and looking forward to the discussion. Um, so as Gloria said, I am going to uh, spend about 20 minutes explaining fairly new scientific findings um, that are upending how we have conventionally thought about uh, policy around children in in, the, in our in this country, what scientists are establishing, many of you have have, have heard this, is that the first one thousand days of life shape a child's brain in a way that sets the foundation for all future development, really to an extent uh, that we hadn't been entirely uh, we hadn't understood th uh, clearly before. So my presentation is going to explain those findings uh, and what the implications are, um, what I think the implications are for early childhood policy. One of the things that I find most exciting about early childhood policy, this field, is that I don't think there's another policy area that has such a strong body of scientific knowledge that points us in such clear policy directions. So in terms, or clear policy priorities, how to accomplish these goals, how to get the thing done that has to get done, how to make sure that all children are, are, are nurtured and cared for in their very first days of life in such a way that they have a chance to flourish. Uh, that's, a, that's, 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 that's a critical priority for us. And my hope is that after tonight, 
will you all will have a clearer sense of how important that is that we focus on this policy area um, more than we than we have to date. Put our heads together and figure out how to ensure a good start for all children. So, I mean, he we're here to talk about early childhood, but I want to start um, by talking about school for just a minute. For most of the 20th century, starting in the beginning of the 20th century, school was seen as the pathway to a successful future in America. We've long viewed the public schools as the key to ensuring opportunity for every child and as the critical pipeline for a productive uh, citizenry. And over the last several decades, we've dedicated a huge amount of energy and resources to making sure that the schools work for all children. That focus on schooling served our purposes for several decades. But over the past several years, it's become increasingly clear that the K-12 schools are failing to ensure opportunity for all students and prepare new generations for productive work. In Colorado, for example, among low-income fourth graders, that's about 40% of the fourth graders in Colorado, almost eight out of 10 are below proficient in reading, almost seven out of 10 below proficient in math. Among low-income eighth graders, over three quarters are below proficient in both reading and math. 28% of students drop out of high school without earning a, a diploma and less than a quarter of Colorado students persist through college to earn an on-time college degree. These outcomes are typical of states across the country, and they're not for lack of, uh, of trying. Public spending on the K-12 schools has almost quadrupled since the mid-1960s and has more than doubled since the 1980s. Even as achievement scores have remained entirely flat. So across the country, in addition to spending much more money, we've been trying a whole range of approaches to improve the K-12 schools. Everything from standards and accountability to school choice to common core. We've thought maybe more school is the answer. So we added kindergarten. So now children start school when they're five instead of when they're six. And now we're adding pre-K. So they start when they're four instead of five. We all know that good schools are critical. And that's especially true in the youngest grades. But a growing body of evidence is suggesting that we may be looking for solutions at the wrong time and in the wrong place. There's a growing body of science that is establishing that gaps emerge much earlier in life than we previously understood. Gaps between advantaged and disadvantaged children begin emerging as early as nine months of age by 18 months, toddlers from low-income families can already be several months behind in language development. And those gaps continue to widen, leaving disadvantaged children up to two years behind by age five. So the bottom line is really this. There, the achievement gap that we measure in K-12 neither originates in nor can be closed by the schools. In fact, the root of the achievement gap is this. Many children are entering school unprepared to succeed. Schooling is not creating achievement gaps. It's failing to close the gaps that are present at school entry. And as we have been focusing 
this accelerating, intensifying t attention and resources on fixing the K-12 schools, what we've been missing is the importance of uh, children's earliest years. There is, wow, well, <laughs> this is a bit of a bummer, sorry about that, okay. Excuse me, is there a different clicker? No. Okay, I'm gonna just keep going with this one and I apologize. So science has provided us with two key concepts that explain why the first 1,000 days of life matter so much for children's development. The first of those is that brains are built, not born. So for a long time, we thought that brains were kind of like little hands. A, little, a baby is born and its hand is a perfectly formed little hand, just small. So we just wait and it grows into a grown-up hand. We, for a long, long time, we thought that's how brains are. But science has, 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 has found that brains are constructed from the ground up in the following way. The human brain is built out of about 100 billion <coughs> brain cells. And the way those brain cells function is they are connected with trillions and trillions of connections called synapses. So the brain cells by themselves can't do anything. They need the synapses to make our brains work. So a baby is born with 100 billion brain cells, which is about the same adults have. The difference between our brains and a baby's brain is in a baby's brain, those cells are very poorly connected. There are very few connections between those brain cells. Starting at birth, a baby's brain is establishing one million new connections per second. And the way that those connections get established, those synapses get established, is through the baby's experience with the world and in particular, experience with the humans in the baby's world, the interactions that the baby is having with caregivers uh, 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 around him or her. So that is the process by which the brain is, 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 is wired, which is, which is how the brain uh, works. So what that means is that foundational human development begins not at age, oh, fabulous. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Foundational human development begins There it is, there it is. <laughs> OK. Not at age four, five, or four, or three, but at birth. This is what that early development, maybe I need to point it this way. I think so. There we go. Aha. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> you see, I'm building synapses right in front of you. <laughs> so this is what foundational development looks like on the outside. And this is what it looks like on the inside. So this uh, graph shows the synapses, at the synaptic connections in a newborn's brain. So what you see is those are the brain cells and then those, those, those thready things are the beginning of growing synaptic uh, connections. Then in the first months of life, as you see, those, those connections are growing, as I said, at a rate of a million per second growing very, very rapidly. More is happening from in the years from birth to age three than in any other period of human life. So if our brains started growing like that right now, within a couple of years, we'd all be Nobel Prize winning scientists <laughs> or Olympic athletes. 
<laughs> this is a very accelerated period of change, which makes sense when you think about a baby on the first day of life is a helpless infant that cannot even hold its head up by itself. And within 30 months is a talking, running, jumping, fully participating human being. It's really extraordinary when you think of it, um, when, you, when you think of it like that. So the first key concept is that brains are built, not born. The wiring of the brain begins at birth in an intensive process that does not happen automatically, but is catalyzed, driven by children's ongoing day-to-day, minute-to-minute interaction with, with caregivers. The second, critic, the second key concept is, uh, is, is that the scientists have discovered what they are describing as critical periods in development. So those are stages of development during which particular capacities are especially sensitive or even require certain kinds of environmental influence. So the, a metaphor for thinking about this is uh, um, wet concrete. So I have a couple of little tiny videos to explain this. When you have, can you play the first video? Thank you. When you have just laid concrete, the slightest pressure will make a deep mark in wet, just laid concrete. When that concrete is partially dried, I'm trying to go to the next slide. Can you play the, ne the next one? You can still change its form, but you have to press harder for longer and you're not going to make as big of a mark. When the concrete has dried completely, we have to do something like this. Can you play the next video? So I've shared this with some colleagues of mine, and uh, one of them was saying to me a few days ago, he was in a meeting on um, an AEI colleague on prison reform. And they were talking about um, uh, work education programs for prisoners. And he said he thought of, of this metaphor because it just becomes very difficult to change things once they're fully developed. At the same time, I want to emphasize, we never say that it is too late. But getting, shaping wet concrete is just a lot easier than shaping it once it's, once it's set. So when you're, when, you're, when you're laying foundations correctly, is cheaper and more effective. Later, it, you get, it's less effective, less efficient, uh, and in some cases is, 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 is difficult to, uh, to, 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 do it, to do it all without, without damaging, the, uh, damaging the, the material in the process. So how does this second, um, this second key concept of critical periods apply to human development? So this graph, I'm about to show you, describes when the human brain is growing most rapidly and is most sensitive to outside influence for cognitive language and sensory development, for better or for worse. So the, this, is, this, this graph here is not showing so you see there's, there's seeing, hearing, touch, language and speech, higher cognitive functions. Birth, it, you see the steep rise after birth. And then this is 
whoops, for, that's uh, age four. So this graph is not saying that children are acquiring more language in the first year of life than at any other time. This graph is showing when, metaphorically speaking, the concrete is wettest for the development of those fundamental brain capacities. Another way of looking at this is grade level reading begins at birth. So this next graph is, shows critical periods for development of what are called self-regulation and executive function skills, which many of you have heard of. Those are the skills that are making you study for your final exams when you don't feel like it. Those are being able to sit down, for young children, sit down, pay attention, follow directions, cope with frustration when you're faced with a, with a difficult task. These are success skills that we must have to be successful in school and in life, but they develop, their critical period for development is, uh, begins before we can walk. And their most the, 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 the span of the development of these skills occurs uh, long before we, uh, we enter school. So I'm going to show a short video of a child who is about um, 36 months old. Um, he's so just turning three. That shows the tremendous skills that um, he's already developed in a supportive environment. And the way he's using the skills he's developed to build new ones. So So I've seen that video probably 25 times. I never get tired of it. That look of triumph on his face. But learning new things is hard, and we build our brains by learning new things. So that kind of focus and stick to 
is what's required, but he is just three, and he spent the 36 months of life building those skills um, to a degree that many children don't have the opportunity to do. So the importance of what I've been talking about in terms of early human development, the importance of, or of the foundational importance of early development has been true for thousands of years. So we didn't have scientists telling us this, but it's always been the case. What's changed is the world that young children are growing up in has changed enormously. In 1940, fewer than one in 10 mothers with children under age six were in the workplace, and today almost uh, seven in 10 are. Two thirds of children from birth to age five now have all residential parents in the workforce. And what that means is that over half of American children under age five are uh, in childcare for an average of 36 hours a week. So when we talk about early childhood so far in America, what we talk about is uh, pre-K. So in a year of full day, full, a full year of, of full day pre-K for four-year-olds is about a little under 1,200 hours. However, that is compared to a child who enters full-time childcare as an infant will have spent almost 12,000 hours in childcare by the time they get to kindergarten. What that means is that childcare is America's most important early education program. Those not only are the number of hours enormous compared to the number of hours in a full day pre-K program, those thousands and thousands of hours are occurring during the most critical period of development. So the critical implication of what I've been talking about here is early childhood education means human development, not school. And in fact, that's true for all of us. We have come in our society to equate <clears throat> education with school. But human education is human development. School is one fairly narrow place where human development occurs. Education is a much broader process. And that is especially true for young children. Early childhood education, therefore, means early development, not early school. This is a graph that some of you may have seen um, by James Heckman and his colleagues, Nobel Prize winning economist at, at University of Chicago which is the rates of return to human capital investment. A dollar spent earlier in the lifespan has a greater financial return in terms of workforce productivity. <clears throat> and the reason for this is that the education process is cumulative. Each stage builds on the other. So later investments are, the, the, the earlier investments increase the value of all subsequent investments down the line. That does not diminish the purpose, uh, the importance of K-12 schools and of higher education, but the effectiveness of those later investments depends on the investments made in early childhood. Public policy always lags behind new knowledge and understanding, and early childhood is no exception. So if you think about education as birth to 18 spending, 
K-12, pre-K, and child care. This is the current distribution of state dollars spent in Colorado. From a development point of view, this is unlikely to be the strategically smartest way of distributing scarce education dollars. I'm going to close with a quote that I love from uh, President Herbert Hoover. Um, he convened in 1930 the uh, White House Conference on Child Health and Protection and spoke to the conference. He said, we aim to set children's feet upon sure paths to health and well-being and happiness. Let no one believe that these are questions which should not stir a nation, that they are below the dignity of statesmen or governments. If we could have but one generation of properly born, trained, educated, and healthy children, a thousand other problems of government would vanish. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Can I bring you to the legislature? For <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll work it out. Yeah. <laughs> so Nadine is sitting in the middle for that very reason, to kind of bring together all that early childhood science and information that Catherine has provided us, and then begin to develop a policy perspective for you all. So Nadine. Great. Um, thank you so much. And thanks all for having me. It's really an honor to be here. And I think bars are on. Or, um, do I need to do anything? Can you hear me OK? Mm -hmm. Let's run between both. <laughs> PowerPoint. Yes. <Yeah. laughs> Should I trade? Oh, we could just take the microphone or, yep. Oh, we could take them out. But oh, that right, works, okay. too. I'll just use hers. <laughs> My sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, so great. Um, so it, it um, um, I'm executive, executive director of Patriot Voices with Senator Rick Santorum. It was founded in 2012. And it, we really um, were working. Our real main purpose was to, to, to get conservatives talking about working family policy. And so as many of you know, Rick Santorum ran for president in 2012. And he won 11 states largely because he appealed to um, blue-collar America in a way that really hadn't been done in a GOP primary before. And he ended up, I don't know if you know this, but won Colorado. So things have changed in a few years, <laughs> yes, thanks to this gentleman in the front row. <laughs> um, you know, and in 2016, Donald Trump surprised everybody by turning out work in America in a way that had never been seen before. You know, in Trump, people saw, they saw hope. They saw a better future, somebody that understood the struggle of working in America that really the, the elite, political elites really hadn't um, zoned in on. Um, so, you know, the point that I think the, the success Trump had in bringing out the working class was it just showed that people want to work. You know, there's value in it. Um, obviously, the number one value being able to take care of your family. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what every mother and father really wants to do. You know, but, but the economy has changed. I mean, my own father um, worked in a mill. My mother was a receptionist. You know, they raised three children and um, saved for retirement. Um, Marco Rubio just recently wrote an op-ed where he talked about, a lot of you have heard about his family story. His mother was a maid. His father was a bartender. He said they couldn't raise a family on that income today in today's fiscal environment. So th things have changed. It's much harder for families to make ends meet, let alone raise children. Oops. We're going to start by, <laughs> okay. You know, when talking about families, we have to consider the financial reality. And it's really amazing to think that 44% of Americans cannot afford $400 emergency. So what does this mean for an unwanted pregnancy? You know, unfortunately, a lot of studies have shown that the, the number one reason people have an abortion in women is, say, um, because they can't afford the child. And in 2014, 49% of women having abortions lived below the poverty line. If we're pro-life, how do we say keep the baby but then don't offer any support? This graph here is from the Department of Labor that shows the decline of two-parent households. So um, in mother-only families, you can see how a majority are from um, minority communities. So this is, um, and then this, you can see, I'll give you a second to take a look at it and move it. Sorry, do you need to see it? Do you see it okay? Um, you, you have the idea that it's going in the wrong direction. <laughs> but this graph is more important because it really shows the financial reality of what that means. You know, it means people living really close to the poverty line or be, and the average is about at the poverty line, which means a lot of them are, are way below. Um, so it's harder um, 
you know, for us to be able to stay out of poverty with the destruction of family. And so, um, I don't know if you guys have seen the studies by Robert Putnam on the left and Charles Murray on the right where they're talking about the decline of families. You know, it's something in America that, that's continuing to happen, and especially the divide when it comes to, to income. Families with, with less income are struggling to make ends meet, and their children are, as you just heard, are really struggling. And, you know, no one is blaming, you know, the no one is, is saying it's the parents' fault, it's the children's fault. The point is there's so little support for families, especially in low-income areas. And so that's a really big question and one that I hope a lot of you will choose to look into as you continue your school, your studies. How do, as conservatives, how do we build up families? And so, you know, we, we definitely need to keep continuing to look at things like justice reform and, and poverty and all the different um, important topics that are out there. But the other thing we need to look at is how can we help families to start off strong from the very beginning? Just like Catherine was saying, when the, you know, when the concrete is soft, how can we really start everyone off the strongest they can possibly be? So we can all agree, the left and the right, that a strong family, whether it's a single family or, or, or a husband and wife, starting off strong is better for the child, it's better for the parent, it's better for the community, it's better for the school, it's better for businesses, it's better for the economy. There is no downside. Yet, we often just fly back through this, don't put any funding, no you know, real thought process in this part of time of life. And the focus, as you heard, is all on you know, the K to 12. So what we really um, love, and I know that Mirage has worked really hard on this, is, is the two-generation approach, which is policies that, you know, not just focusing on the baby, not just focusing on the parent, but ones that benefit both at the same time, both together and individually. And um, so we... Um, I love this slide from um, um, the pro-life group, whoops, um, live action. Now it's too sensitive for me, <laughs> or not. User error. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and this is actually from her, their Facebook page, love them both, you know, and so, um, so much of this just fits right into the conservative community, but we haven't been leading on these kind of issues. We've been letting Democrats lead on it when really this fits right into our, our portfolio of issues and should we should be leading on. So um, we, um, have really been um, lucky at Patriot Voices to be able to work with um, Ivanka Trump's office to help build support in the conservative community. And so I had the opportunity to, to about a year and a half ago start bringing conservative leaders in to meet and we would talk about the ch child tax credit and at that before time we were talking about tax reform and then we would segue into talking about paid family leave and, and it was really interesting because so many of the people we brought in had literally never had a conversation about paid family leave. And, and, and the response was often similar, which is the person leaning forward and saying paid family leave as if it was the first time they'd spoken the words. And so the responses were really varied. Like um, Lila Rose, I think, might have cried. Literally, she was so excited. And a couple of people would tear up like they were so moved by the idea that, wow, this, this, we could do this. And then there are other people that hostile is probably a fair word. <laughs> that the idea that conservatives would be talking about something that, that is government getting bigger or whatever, whatever reason that um, just immediately struck them as this can't be a good thing for us. And I'm, I'm pleased to say most of those folks um, are, all, are very supportive of paid family leave now. It's one of those things, once you do a deep dive and you see the, the benefit to society, and I'm going to show you some of the just top lines, um, are overwhelming that, um, as you heard even from Catherine, understanding the importance of those early, early years, you can't replace this important time in baby's life. So. Um, Unfortunately, only 14% of private industry employees have access to paid leave. And, um, and so, you know, like I said, we really felt like paid leave is such a great issue for working families because so many people have to be in the workforce. But as you can see, it's even less for um, low-income families. So, um, and they're the ones that really need this the most. Um, paid leave also is, an, is the benefits to both the mother and the baby are enormous. It's almost... I mean, I could literally fill slides and slides of this, but one of the main things that, that um, studies have shown from the Institute of Health is that an increase of 10 weeks of paid leave was associated with a 10% lower infant mortality rate. That rate dropped another 13% if they're home another month. So that alone is just a shocking statistic. But women who take leave are less likely to experience depression and have improved physical and mental health. And of course, we all know the, the bonding effect on children. So many studies have been 
we've, we've seen with the mother and the baby how important it is for both of them to have that lifelong bomb. But, you know, we, I just want to throw out, too, that stay-at-home mom's financial reality, is that's not always an option. We, obviously, it's great when one of the parents can stay home and take care of their child. No one's saying we need to come up with some sort of government program or some sort of way to replace that. But the reality is, as we talked about that first slide, is it's just not an option for a lot of families um, for a lot of different reasons. And so how, how in this new financial reality do we continue to be able to help families? So the, this economic reality means this, that 23% of all mothers, almost a quarter, go back to work within two weeks of having a baby. I cannot even imagine how heartbreaking that must be and, and how difficult it would be for them. And as you can see, um, that 40% um, um, of all households, the mother's the primary um, breadwinner. So they're in a situation where they have to go back to work. And one of the key points that I think we need to make is that, as you can see, 48% of all mothers with incomes under $30,000 go on public assistance after the birth of a baby. So if we could somehow keep them connected to the workforce, then we're, we are, they're going to have a better outcome for themselves, for their child, um, and be able to, to increase, you know, upward, have that upward mo chance at upward mobility that really will only exist if they stay in the workforce. Some of the most exciting research we've seen recently is, up, is the bonding with fathers. Um, not to overemphasize this, because obviously the bonding with mothers is huge. Because everyone has always talked about the hormones that, that women um, produce when they're they give birth when they're um, birth when they're breastfeeding, and but but they have found those same hormones with men when they're home with their babies the first few weeks. And there's a professor at um, Princeton University that gets all excited explaining to this. That would be great for any of you guys to have um, talk about how much this changes the course of the father's life, the child's life, um, to be involved in those first few weeks. And so we we know that um, when fathers are around those first two weeks, they they become smitten with their child, and then they're more likely, studies have shown if they take leave, they're more likely to be involved in child rearing activities. And then other studies separate from those show that fathers that are involved in child rearing activities are, stay involved in their lives longer. And there are other studies, of course, that show that children that have involved fathers do better academically, they do better emotionally, they're more resilient. So, you know, so many different reasons why we really should um, do our best to, to have those parents be home and, and fathers be a part of that process. So the other thing is is, is really business. Um, in California, they've had paid family leave the longest, and the um, department, the U.S. Department of Labor, did some research on that. And, and, and it's really shocking to take a look at the, at how businesses responded to the paid family leave there so positively. And there was a lot of fear that it would um, have a negative effect on business, but it's been really positive. So this is a really, really important point that paid family leave could also have a big impact on, is really changing the birth rate in this country. As you can see, um, in 1960, the birth rate was 3.7 live births per woman. As you can see, it's dropped to a low of 1.76 live births per woman. So we need a replacement rate of 2.1 in order to keep our population for budgetary reasons. So what this means is all of you are going to pay more taxes <laughs> if we don't get more children. And, and for your retirement, if the next generation doesn't have any kids, there's no one going to be, be paying for your retirement. So again, you know, there's so many different reasons. St some studies have shown that paid family leave is listed as one of the reasons families are choosing to not have more children because it is expensive. I know we were talking earlier about how 33% of the state's um, child care in those states is higher than um, um, state college. So, you know, you're paying more than you will pay when you go to college to, put, to have child care. It's just such an expensive thing. So how can we, how can we change this and how, how can we approach this from a conservative standpoint? You know, one of the things at Patriot Voices, we've, the reason we started um, getting involved in policy, we're working on health care and a lot of different things, is because what we've seen is um, so much of the time these kind of policies, those of us on the right, um, we just feel like they're not in our lane, so we just stay away from them. And then, then we're not at the table, and then things happen we had no say in. In, in policies that um, we didn't get to help craft. And so, you know, there are so many great policies out there, whether it be education or work, all sorts of working family policies that, you know, as conservatives, we should be leading on. We should be deciding what these look like. We're really excited about the Economic Security for New Parents Act, which is a new bill by um, Marco Rubio. And as you can see, it's, um, it's a paid family leave bill that really has no cost um, because you would take your own 
leave out of your social security and then you would just retire later. So it doesn't expand government. What it does is it simply adds a flexibility to government. So um, it, um, it is around 70% of, of salary. And um, the, the neat thing about the transferability that I think Senator Rubio is, is so excited about, but that, um, so if each parent has two months, then um, they could both take the leave, but one of the parents can go back to work after a month, say, and the other parent stays home for three months. So there's flexibility. They can decide how they want to do it for their own children. And the other thing is it's optional. So if it's um, you know, not something you want to take or you need to take, you don't have to take it. But for those families who are having a child is a financial catastrophe, and you know, here we're like wanting parents to cherish that child, to want to invest in that child, to want to sacrifice for that child, and having the child literally ruins their lives because now they lose their jobs, they lose their home, they you know can't make ends meet, or and, and, and the financial stress for couples. You know, if we could provide that kind of um, support where they're able to draw these funds, and, and it could really make a huge different difference. The other thing that, that I think is important to note is in terms of most of these very generous federal um, paid family leave um, plans that are out there, they're connected to FMLA, which is the um, Family Medical um, leave, Med Medical leave Act that was passed 25 years ago that protects jobs, and but it only applies to um, um, employers employees that work for firms with at least 50 employees, and they've had to work there for over a year. So those plans, while they sound really generous, they don't help this very community we're talking about, which is sometimes the gig economy, or people have part-time jobs, or you know, a lot of people that are in minimum wage work, or that haven't worked someplace for a year, or you know, as you know, some places don't, so they don't have to play Obamacare, don't put people on full-time, so then they have two part-time jobs to try to put it together. All that entire community we're talking about helping would not be um, have the benefit of those plans. So this plan is unique in that it really does go all the way across the board and kind of help um, help uh, really the the people that we feel like all I mean all of us need to be able to invest in our families. But when we're looking about <laughs> looking at poverty and looking at how we can really close that achievement gap, a lot of it is just helping all families, no matter what kind of income they have, no matter what class they're in, that they would be able to pull together um, and, and really be able to do the best for their child and really stay connected to the workforce and stay on a path where up, for upward mobility. And, you know, there no there, everyone benefits from this. Senator-elect Brittany Pedersen will now talk to us a little bit about the uh, Colorado policies that are affecting or can affect early childhood and uh, paid family leave. And it, just a brief look back and then maybe look forward to 2019. All right. Well, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Brittany Pedersen. I'm uh, the senator-elect for this area. And I'm impressed with how many people showed up uh, so late to have this conversation. So really dedicated students here and community members. <laughs> uh, so I was the chair of the House Education Committee and also the chair of the Early Childhood School Readiness Commission. And uh, every summer we would look at policies on how to actually address, you know, what, what we do at the Capitol is take all of this information and we know how important those early years are, but what should we do in terms of, of actually working to address and increase access to high quality early child care. Uh, and that is much more complicated than you would think. Uh, unfortunately, there can be a very partisan divide, and so I really appreciate the thoughtful conversations and uh, having, uh, bringing people across the aisle to look at this in a different way because it is some of the best investments that we can make with our, with our taxpayer dollars uh, early on. And so I've worked alongside uh, Sue with Epic on trying to look at ways that we can incentivize businesses to, that's a lot better, thank you. Uh, to increase uh, what they're offering with flexible work schedules, increasing, you know, we looked at tax credits. How can we uh, ensure that businesses are doing the right thing? How can we increase access to preschool and kindergarten? But as they point out, that's still insufficient. But it is also a critical piece if we want to uh, increase access to, uh, we, we know if, if a kid has preschool, they are much more likely to succeed later, but I know that um, there are also other uh, earlier access problems that we need to address. Uh, but what we've been doing is we tried to, before I actually came uh, to the Capitol, they looked at 
access to early childhood education and in, in increasing, uh, creating a Qualistar program so that they would rate how uh, the quality of child care and, and create incentives there. So what we saw though is while we had good intentions to increase high quality, it actually, uh, we have some of the highest child care costs in the nation. And so we're constantly struggling with how we incentivize, how we create high standards, but also recognizing that people are barely getting by today. Uh, so one of the policies that has been brought year after year at the Capitol, and it hasn't gone through yet, is a uh, Paid Family Medical Leave Act, which is a different proposal. This is a state policy that would actually create a, an insurance program. So you would, when, it, when you uh, go to sign up with all of your paperwork with your new job, part of that would also be uh, signing up for this insurance program. And it would take two to five dollars out of your paycheck every week towards a fund. So that not only if you have to take leave, if you choose to have a child, that you actually have three months with that child, which we know is a critical time period, but also if you have a family member who's ill or you, you, know, you have an emergency in your life, that you actually have those emergency funds there to help support you through that process and that you're able to go back into the workforce. Uh, I understand that that can be, uh, you know, my friends across the aisle don't always look at that with open arms because of creating a new insurance program. So um, I think that it's really important that we look at streamlining this process for businesses and making sure that we're looking at uh, creative and new ways of actually trying to ensure that we are finally offering uh, paid family medical leave here in Colorado. I think that's five states have already implemented this in the United States. And as you know, uh, we are the only developed country that doesn't offer paid family leave. So um, I'm glad that we're all moving forward on the left and the right to look at what options there are. Uh, happy to uh, go into other areas. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I got the easy job tonight. I'm just coming in to say hello and <laughs> answering questions that you have. Um, but I think that, you know, when I was first elected, um, the most important thing is that we actually listen to each other and work together. And when you build relationships down at the Capitol and uh, it's, it's amazing how many people you can bring to your side that you never thought would be there. Uh, and I know that there are plenty of people who care deeply about this on both sides of the aisle. And so I feel confident that we're gonna get some, some good things done this year. Thank you so much. We're going to open the uh, rest of the, the uh, evening with questions from the audience. And if we don't have questions from the audience, then I've got a couple that I would love to ask. So um, I think this would be an important time for you all to engage and support our um, speakers with some very difficult questions. <laughs> And if you have a question, raise your hand, because we have people watching online and they need to hear from the microphone. So um, if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand and then we'll get the microphone to you. Uh, person over here. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sarah and thank you all for sharing. That was really insightful. Uh, I would like to ask Senator like Pedersen, I'm wondering when you're talking about legislative level when it comes to paid family leave, I know there's some private companies that do paid family leave and they're few and far between, I feel like. How much of it takes place, or does this reform, I guess, need to take place on the legislative level and how much takes place like with individual business owners um, providing that for their employees? Is that, does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I'm sure Sue could give you the exact amount. Uh, but unfortunately, it's, it is few and far between. And so uh, while some businesses are offering this and we've looked at creating tax incentives to try to bring businesses along, it's just quite frankly, it's not going to capture everybody. When we talk about the gig economy, when we talk about uh, people who are living in poverty currently, whose kids are showing up significantly behind others who have access um, that they don't. And, you know, I was lucky I had access to preschool, but um, probably not high, high quality early childcare. So um, it's, we have a lot to do to actually close that gap and ensure that we, we don't have kids falling through the cracks. So 
Uh, I don't know if Sue wants to add to how many businesses in Colorado actually offer that. But it's a privilege. Another question? Yes, ma'am, right here. Uh, we'll get a microphone for you. Why don't you come around here? Or She's right here. Oh. It's okay, come here. <laughs> Thanks. Great. I'm just wondering if there aren't some innovative ways we could tie in child care with senior living homes with the old folks mm. because they're at a loss. They don't know what to do with themselves. And it seems to me we could just bring the two together and it would be cheaper. There you go. I like it. That's some good innovative thinking. Any comment so, on that? Yeah. So I love that idea very much. And it's something that's been done in a couple of places. The block against it is people worrying about illness. Because children get sick so often. And the concern is that it will cause you know massive epidemics among the elderly population and that it could hurt them. I'm not convinced. Um, but if there's anyone here who is working in, in the medical field, I, I think this is so enormously promising. It, it's it's the, the, you have senior citizens who have time. They have, they're, they're often lonely. They need to feel needed. And children, young, very young children, um, desperately need exactly what they have, time and attention. Um, so <clears throat> I looked into it and found that it's gotten tied up in this, in this health issue. So we need to figure out how to stop the common cold somehow. <laughs> Got a question right here. He's coming with the microphone. Hi, I just saw in 1940 only one in 10, both parents working. But in 1940, most parents were married. There was a husband and a wife. And I think we have to quit uh, educating people and saying, well, just take the pill or wear a condom or whatever and let somebody use you because that's what they're doing. And if they get pregnant, the guy is usually gone. So I think we have to go back and, because two parent families don't have the problem that single parent families have and 40% of the babies now are born, uh, 40, uh, you know, 40% are born out of wedlock. And I think that has to change. I think we gotta quit promoting, you know, you can, you can have sex and uh, uh, you'll be just fine, but just be sure you take the pill. We found out already in 2005 that young women who take the pill before they have a baby, the, the World Health Organization came out and said, you know what, um, you're at high risk for breast cancer, liver cancer, and cervical cancer, okay? So why are we doing this in the first place? Why are we allowing people going into our schools when the Christian parents are telling their children, no, you don't do that, but then the schools come in and undermine the parents who are sending their kids to that school? And we, now we have this problem. And I just think uh, we're making problems. And uh, I think that has to change. You get married before you have children. At least I thought that was what I was supposed to do, and that's what I did. And you didn't sleep around. Yeah. And so you guys want to respond the, to that? The hook, the hook, <laughs> the hook up culture, the hook up culture does not work. There you go. Yeah, so I couldn't agree with you more as you I'm sure no, because you are, have obviously studied this issue, um, but for, in case the rest of you guys don't know, for um, babies born to African-American African women under age 25, 90% are born to unmarried parents. For babies born to white mothers under age 25, 70, 70% are born to unmarried parents. From an early childhood point of view, just my, on my topic, what, I, what we know young children need to thrive are resources, 
first and foremost, nurture and attention resources, and they need money. So when you have two adults in a family instead of one, you've just doubled the resources available to that child in one fell swoop, no government program required. The way I am thinking about this issue is as follows. We used to have very high rates of smoking in this country. We discovered that smoking is a cause of lung cancer. So we did two things at the same time. We treated people with lung cancer. There was a whole enterprise that did that, right? We, we, when people have lung cancer, the researchers tried to find better and better cures, and we treated those people. At the same simultaneous moment, a whole other group of people were mounting a public education campaign to reduce smoking, which occurred. Smoking rates in this country have dra dropped drastically. In my thinking, and I would love to discuss this with you afterwards, because this is something I've been thinking a lot of, a, about a, a great deal, we have to do them both at the same time. Yeah. Any baby that's born, here's the baby. And we've got to do everything we, we're, first of all, we're stuck with the baby because that baby is going to be in our K-12 schools, in our society. If that baby goes to prison or drops out and goes on by government programs, we are all stuck with that baby, right? In addition, just from a, from a, from a, a human dignity point of view, we all want to create a society where every baby has a chance to flourish. However, that's the kind of the, the short-term treat the lung cancer um, issue. We've got to figure out strategies for, and we've got to bring the left and the right, because the left won't talk about this right now, and, and, and I, I haven't quite figured out why. I think in the early childhood field, that's possibly one avenue because people are always already talking about the resources that young children need. But we've got to put our heads together to figure out ways of changing the culture around this. Just as one quick example, I had a conversation last week with a conservative economist at American Enterprise Institute, and I was asking him about this issue. He has not really thought about this issue because he does, he does economics of healthcare and he, he's just not thinking about this. And I said, well, what if we gave people marriage grants, like startup grants, like we pay them to get married, and every year they stay married, they get extra money. Now, <laughs> I know some of my other colleagues at AAA, I would hate that idea a lot. This guy thought it was a great idea. And what he said is, people respond, be behaviors change through positive incentives, not negative incentives. I don't know, but I think there's such a vibrant conversation to be had about how to, to that's the long-term solution to most of what we're talking about. Yeah, maybe. So apparently if you follow these three rules, have a baby, after, wait to have a baby till you're married, graduate from high school, and be employed, you have, you're under 10% chance of being under the poverty line. So, yeah. you know, those three, three things, first of all, and the other point I wanna make is, I don't know if you've read the book by Robert Putnam called Our Kids, it's you know a, a liberal professor from Harvard talking about how you know the divorce rate, the um, having children out of marriage, those things. It's it's really interesting. It's not a Republican or a Democrat thing. It's not a Christian or, or non-Christian thing. It's really an income thing. People in the higher income level, they their kids don't do those activities. You know, you look at candidates running for president. You look at the Democrats. You know, they're 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 still married. Their their kids didn't have children before they got married, and it, it wasn't because they shame people for that. It's because they it, their their children the outcome will be worse if they do those things, and they don't want their children to have those kind of outcomes. So I think part of it is is you know, the left and the right needs to talk more openly about this. It's a better choice, not not because we're saying they're better people because they made better choices. And we're not trying to shame people for having a child out of wedlock. It's not like that. It's just your outcomes so much harder for you to do it in that order. Statistics show that it's just going to be a harder road for you. And so we, we really should, on both the left and the right, be encouraging people to make different kind of choices that give them a better shot um, and their children a better shot. All right. Young man right here. Oh, Brittany, do you want to? Oh, uh, go ahead, please. To, no, I go for it. All responded. I don't know if we all want to respond to every yeah. comment, but. I think that mo you know, most women would not choose to be single moms, and so that's why 
making sure that they're able to choose when and if they want to have a child is a really critical piece. And uh, so, we, you know, different perspectives here on, on that piece, but I think access uh, to birth control and making sure that you do have those choices is going to be uh, the key thing in making sure you make those decisions and that you, you can have a, a child when you know that it's right for you. This young gentleman right here. Hi. Um, instead of having a public, um, a public school system that goes through K through 12, why can't we have a um, school voucher system that allows the parents to choose which kind of private school they could go to and give a possibly a better education to the child? That's a great question. I wrote a, uh, an op. Yeah. Oh, okay. I think um, is this one right? Yeah. Um, I wrote an op-ed. If you give me your email after um, after afterwards, I can send you an op-ed I wrote. Um, I, the title was something like "School Choice Begins at Birth." So, this idea there is a school choice movement that is working towards just that—a voucherized system. Jeb Bush has been in the forefront of this, and part of my point in my in my op-ed is. Why should the government control nothing about your child's education except for that it can't start till it's five, right? So if you, if, I mean, this is not what you'd consider a realistic proposal at the moment, but I agree with you in principle. If you said children's education has got to be, is gonna work best if it's under control of parents, parents are not going to put their kid in nightmare childcare for five years waiting until they get their kindergarten voucher. If they can use that money, they will use that money when they know their child's development is most, uh, is most critical. A kind of a, 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 another version of that idea that I have thought about is not only are our schools controlled by, run by government, funded by government, run by government, attendance in the public schools is also mandated by the government. So if you eliminated mandatory high school attendance and enabled people to go to work in our apprenticeship programs, there would be more, you could have programs where scholarships were available. That would also free up a lot of public dollars that could be made available to families much earlier in their children's lives. So I think there's a whole range of those kinds of ideas that um, challenge our current system. And the ideas are easy. It's easier to think about the ideas than to make them happen. And we grappled with this a lot on the education committee. And uh, you know, I believe strongly that we need to keep our public schools as strong as I can, and they're, they're already struggling significantly. Um, but we do need to look at ways that we, like you were saying, uh, help incentivize, uh, look at how we can streamline uh, high school and create other opportunities so that they're actually, right now we have the concurrent enrollment program so that they're graduating with two years of college already paid for, or you know apprenticeship programs and alternative pathways because all of you just came out of high school not too long ago, and I'm sure you look back at uh, your last two years and maybe don't remember much about what you learned, just kind of looking forward to college like many people. Um, so I think that there's ways that we can utilize that time and be creative uh, and draw those dollars down to early childhood. Um, we've got a wrap here, so I want to make some final remarks and then if you'd like to make some closing remarks too. Um, so I want to make sure everyone understands who's sitting up here. So um, with Senator-elect Patterson, you have a member of the Democrat Party. Um, with Nadine, you have somebody who uh, worked for Rick Santorum and is appointed by President Trump. And then we have one of the greatest conservative think tanks with Catherine Stevens, AEI. And what, they've, um, what I've heard them say tonight, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that there is common ground, at least in the sense that we believe that those early years are absolutely critical to keep those kids invested with their parents as much as we possibly can. And the question then is, what does that look like? 
And what I often like to say, you know, when we're thinking about public policy development, what that looks like, we want to start with the principles and work our way to the prescriptions. I think the principles are generally the same, and the prescriptions may have different ideas. How best do you keep a, a mom at home? Um, I'm deeply concerned about what this may do uh, for small business owners, for the business community. I think a lot of conservatives are uh, concerned about those types of mandates that are put upon them. But at the same time, we care deeply about family. At Centennial Institute, we say right down there, faith, family, and freedom. Family. Family is absolutely critical to future. So how do we work out these prescriptions? Um, but I think there's a lot of, of the common principles there, even among our friends on the right and left side that go, you know, we need to keep those kids with their parents as much as we possibly can to invest in them, to achieve everything that Catherine was talking about. But we've got to now work out the prescription differences. Um, and Marco Rubio's put forth ideas uh, it sounds like Brittany's put forth similar ideas here in Colorado, the Democrats have. So we've got to kind of try to figure out those perspectives. Um, do you guys want to make some final remarks and then I'll turn it over to you to close it out? Great. I just really appreciate the, the open conversation. I never have the opportunity to sit on a panel with uh, you know, people from your backgrounds, and I think that we should do that more often. I appreciate you inviting me. I am always open to uh, come and visit your school and meet with you individually. If you ever want to come down to the Capitol, I'd love to have you down there. Uh, we all create better policy when we try to listen and work together, and uh, that's really what, what my focus is at the Capitol. So thanks for having me. It's great having you be here. It's, um, I totally agree that we need to work in a bipartisan way. and. You know, um, so many of the most conservative, um, I know even Senator Santorum and John Hines that I worked for in both in the Senate, and, you know, they worked together a lot in those years. I mean, Rick Santorum never did anything without a Democratic counterpart, but the culture right now is almost if you do something with a Democratic partner, you know, you get, both sides have to deal with, with a lot of unhappy people because it looks like they've sold out or something, and, and, you know, and I think we need to look at people that are in a different political party than us is sometimes they have a different worldview than us. It doesn't mean they don't have the same heart we have. It doesn't mean they don't have the same commitment um, that we have. And, and the only way we're really going to get through these kind of issues is if we're sitting at the table together because it's, that's the only way we, we, that we're going to build the kind of will we need and the grassroots in order to, to, ha to deal with some of these big, big, we're, I mean, we're, we're talking about them like, oh, well, this, have this, and this, but these are really big, big, big ideas and big problems that are going to take you guys, um, unfortunately, it's going to, you're going to still be dealing with it when, when you're, you're delving more into policy, so it's been great being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I just, I just want to echo the, the way that I think we need to be approaching any area of policy, and, and this one in particular, is with first principles. As I said before, the science is extremely clear, and we all need to hold ourselves accountable to that science. So if we do that, there we have an immense amount of common ground just to start with. This, the policy area of early childhood is, is, is it's like the Western frontier. It's like Arizona in 1877. They just laid the Royal Road, and there's no one there. So I think it needs, it needs a lot of good thinking. And as Nadine just said, when you guys are out in the world, uh, it's still going to be in its early phases. So uh, we need as many smart people thinking about this as possible. Along those lines, I just want to mention, you all probably know, American Enterprise Institute has a summer internship program. Um, I would be delighted to talk to any of you about working with me on early childhood issues or help connect you to other scholars working in other policy areas. It's a really vibrant, uh, fascinating place to work. So please talk to me if you're interested in that. Thank you all. I think this has been an incredible evening. And Jeff, thank you and the university for having us. I think I only have one ask, and so now the responsibility is on your shoulders. The best way to start to solve these issues is for each and every one of you to be thoughtful and, and supportive of the challenges that face us and face you all. And don't hesitate to reach out to thought leaders like we've been exposed to tonight and make your, your feelings and your, your concepts known because they want to hear from you. Thank you. <laughs>